is raising cattle right for you? Raising cattle isn't as simple or as tough as you might think. The question about raising cattle, is it right for you? Well, it depends. Let's break it down in this video. We're gonna talk about everything that a new farmer or an aspiring farmer or someone that's raising other animals but wants to get into cattle might wanna know. We're gonna talk about waters, we're gonna talk about fencing, breed choices, hay, pasture management, whether to buy steers versus bred cows, and hopefully give you a little bit of clarity if getting cattle is something that you're thinking about. Now I need to preface that with a lot of this is experience and opinion based, and it's gonna vary from farmer to farmer. It's gonna vary based on how much land you have. It's gonna vary your climate and your conditions that you're raising your cattle in. So what works for me and what works here may be a little different for you. Take that into context when you're thinking about cattle and when you listen to what I say. I'll try to address those things, but everyone's context is a little different. You'll get many different opinions on this. I'm just one, but hopefully it'll give you a little clarity, a little guidance if you're thinking about getting into cattle. All right, let's get started. The first thing we need to talk about if you're gonna get cattle is one, you gotta have fencing. Fencing is what keeps them in. It's like the chicken house or the pig hut of your cattle. There's lots of different fencing, way too many for me to go into this video. You could make multiple videos on just fencing, but I'm gonna give you a brief overview. What we use is electric high tensile fence. This is basically 12 and a half gauge steel, comes in these huge 4,000 foot coils, and we have about five to six strands on all of our pastures. Then we attach electricity to it, and therefore it's electrified. It's more of a, what I call a deterrent. It's not an actual barrier. If a bull or a cow or something wants to go through that fence, it's gonna go through. Having a good charge, keeping it hot, will keep the animals in and also keep a lot of the predators out. Electric fencing, this is what we go with. Downsides to electric fencing, one again, it's not a barrier, it's a deterrent. Depending on how the temperament of your cattle and what they are, you could have issues with that. If you're having a lot of calves on your farm, they can get out easy. Again, they don't go far from mom, so they'll go right back in, so not too big of an issue there. The next type of fencing is post and plank. This is essentially putting in posts about every eight feet and using one by six oak boards. These, I think, are the most aesthetically pleasing. This is your classic farm. They look great. Some you'll see white, some you'll see black. I really love to look at these, and we did some of these around our barn for our horse arena. Downside of these is this is probably the most expensive fencing you can put in. Maybe questionably if you're doing all steel, but it costs a lot, and also it doesn't last as long. It is somewhat of a barrier. It keeps animals in, but it's, I wouldn't say it's a super strong barrier. If you have a lot of money to spend and you want your place to look really nice, this is the fencing to go with. From a practical standpoint, we went with the high tensile, what I just talked about. That's actually the lowest cost per foot is the high tensile electric fence that I talked about. Now in between, you have a couple options. One is woven wire which I would love to have some of that on my farm. I would love to have that more with my chickens. It would help keep the chickens in and I wouldn't have to move electric netting around. With woven wire, you don't have to worry about electricity. It comes in a lot of different sizes as far as the squares, how big the holes are. Woven wire is essentially just a big roll of woven wire and you stretch it, it comes in different heights. This technically is a barrier. If it's too short, I guess animals can get over it, but for all intensive purposes, this is made to keep animals in from a barrier standpoint without the need for electricity. Downsides to this are one, if trees and stuff fall on it, it can damage it. Again, that can happen with your poster plank. And then also keeping weeds off of it. We don't spray at our farm, so managing weeds and stuff really is, we're weed eating. We're mowing lots of it. And with the woven wire, it, it, unless you raise it up off the ground a little bit, it, it's really hard to keep weeds. It, it's like a trellis. So it's easy for stuff to grow up it. Uh, so it just depends on how you're managing your farm. If you are spraying, then this may be the fence to go with for you. And other than that, there's barbed wire. There is steel posts with steel bars. There's lots of other options, but these are the main three. So I would just look at your context, watch some fencing videos. And there's so much to go into this that I can't do it all in this one video. A little story, one year we had a tree come down on our fence. I've actually had a number of trees come down on it. But one of the great things about this high tensile fence is that the only thing I had to replace was a couple plastic insulators and that's it. The fence literally went down to the ground, but we cut the tree, everything popped back up. Luckily it didn't hit any posts. Obviously I would have had to replace those, but that's with any fencing. But it didn't damage the high tensile at all right back up and I, again I just had to replace a couple insulators and it's one thing I like about the fence it's durable it's easy to repair pretty easy to mow around as well as long as you set your bottom strand up 
We have ours. I found six inches is a little bit too low. We had that on one pasture. Now I do pretty much everything on about eight to 10 inches on that bottom strand. That allows me to get part of the deck up under and from both sides, I can get a good mow on it. Then it's just a matter of weed eating around the post a little bit. Eight to 10 inches is a good height on that bottom. And again, it's the one I recommend. It's the cheapest, especially if you're getting started. Fencing is something that when I first started farming, I have put in so much fencing that I have then turned around and taken out. So it's a good idea if, you have to, if you've been at your place for a while to gauge that. Know what you're gonna put there. Try to know, anticipate what you're gonna need the fence for. Cause nothing more frustrating than taking the time to put fence in and then a year later realizing, yeah, this isn't gonna work or this isn't right. And then having to take it all back out. All right, that's fencing. Real quick, I wanted to show you guys the new addition we have to the farm. That's Steve. Steve the mini miniature horse. He is really tiny. He's a little bit smaller than our sheep, if that tells you anything. He was a rescue we got. My wife found him at a local rescue that we've gotten horses from before. And he needed a home. The horses were picking on him there. And so we brought him here. And now he's hanging out with our donkey, our three sheep, and Steve. So anyways, I forgot to share that with you. Anyways, you'll be seeing him in some of our videos. He's about 17 or 18, I believe. Very nice little fella. Probably the smallest horse I've ever seen. That's Steve. All right, let's get back to the cattle. All right, now let's talk about water. You can see me ducking down a little bit here because if I get up, then the sun hits me right in the face. I have shade of the gator behind me here. So if I look a little hunchy, that's why I'm just trying to stay out of the sun. Water, and again, one of the most, we all need it. One of the most important things. And the big thing with water is deciding how much work you want to do. There are in-ground waters you can get put in. We use mirror fountains, which are amazing. They're frost-free waters. Essentially, a well is put in and then water lines run all over to the farm to these in-ground waters. They have balls in the top that essentially block any sunlight from getting in, but the cattle push the ball down to get the water. We found that over winters, the cows drink out of it enough that they don't freeze. So again, we're in Virginia, so we have pretty mild winters but they have worked amazing. The only issue I've ever had with them was one of the little pegs that blocked the water inlet broke and well, it drained the well, but we were able to get that back in. The well recharged within a few hours and we were good to go after replacing that part. These are the best ways to go. This is the most expensive way to go. Now there are some grants you can get. We got our grant through our soil and water conservation, but just know there's really not many strings attached. I have to maintain them for 10 years. They may come and check just to see if they're there. But again, I knew I wanted to do cattle and that was the plan. I think they paid 75% and then I paid 25%. That included drilling the well, that included putting in the lines. So check with your local extension office or local water conservation to see if they may be able to help you with that if that's something you're interested in. Some other options, we have a water wagon. That was the first thing we used when we got here is I bought an old truck bed. I put a 275 gallon IBC tote on the back and basically rigged that up from a water hose to a float into a trough. This works great as well. You just need to have a source, you know, whether that's a water hose or whatever, to fill up the IBC tote. We have these huge cisterns on the property cattle have fed out of historically, and we still use them occasionally as backups. But I actually bought a water pump. I would just pump water out of that into the IBC tote. And that's where I get my water, and that way I could save my well and not have to use the well. We were getting like three gallons a minute out of one of our wells, and it wasn't great. We had to conserve that, so that's why we'd use these big cisterns to do that. Any water source will work. You do need a tractor or something to be able to pull. That water gets very heavy on that IVC tote. I don't know the math, but you can look it up. 275 gallons of water. It's not light. So we did have to use it, have to have a tractor to pull that around. Another option is obviously just having your cattle somewhere near a fountain or somewhere where you can just fill up a trough. I would recommend trying to have that on autofill. You just don't want them to run out. That's the main thing. And again, I know we all do chores. We check but things happen and you know if you leave them without water it's just not great the other thing is if those troughs don't stay full cattle will move them around they will tip them over and so you need a big trough i recommend one of the big 200 gallon troughs and keeping that full with a float that way the cattle can't move it around and cause issues if you're on an auto system and you've got one of those little troughs and the cattle knock it over then that water is going to keep running and then you're going to run your well out whatever so definitely big trough and keep it full. Some people have streams, you have creeks. We try to keep our animals out of that, obviously, just because that washes downstream, that washes into the rivers, and we're just trying to keep the place better than we found it. We're trying to preserve the land and promote conservation and not do things that are gonna harm the land. I would recommend against that. Now, ponds, that's a great one. If you have a pond on your farm, those are perfect. Comes with some management, keeping the cattle out of the pond, banks of the pond, can get eroded. There are ways to do that with fencing and lines and another great way to provide water for your cattle. And then in one of Greg Judy's books, I can't remember which book it was, but um, they actually used huge either tractor tires or these monster tires that they would then pour concrete in the bottom. 
and then set that up as a permanent trough. And you set a couple of up these around the farm. If you have a pond uphill that can run down to these, that way you can fence the pond out, then this will run water into that and you'd have a huge trough that feeds cattle and keeps them out of your pond. So another way to go about it, there's so many ways to do it. I would just recommend Googling. Again, if you can get the frost-free waters, I think that's the best way. They're secure, they're easy to fix. If anything goes wrong, they don't really go wrong. It's like a toilet system almost. You know, they drink water, it fills up. Unless you're in really cold areas, that could be an issue. But that's what I found has worked on our farm the best and takes a lot of the labor out of having to do water so we can focus on other things. Lastly, about water, I'll just mention water quality. You wanna make sure you have good water for your cattle. They could be providing you calves, they could be providing you meat, whatever you're doing. What they eat is then in turn what you're gonna eat. So for their health, the quality, you wanna make sure they have good fresh water. I think that goes without saying, but I figure that should be included because it's important for the health of your animals. All right, now we're gonna talk about hay. I actually just shot this section for 10 minutes and realized I didn't have a record on. What an idiot. Story of my life. We got the cattle here behind us. Hay. This is what I consider kind of the hidden cost of raising cattle. It's not really hidden, but it's the main cost, I think, of raising cattle. Hay is something that, depending on where you're at, obviously, if you have cold winters, your grass is not growing, therefore, you have to have hay to provide food for your animals. We're a grass fed, grass finished operation, and we're farm to table. So we raise our animals out, we take them to the processor, get everything into cuts, and then we either sell as shares, bundle packages, or individual cuts hay is our biggest cost in that process. Here in Virginia, we typically use hay starting November, mid-November to about the second week of April. And it's something you have to factor into if you're selling cattle for beef or if you're just selling calves into the market that you have to factor into your operation. If you're thinking about getting cattle, you have to think about your expenses and this is probably your biggest one. We pay about $40, $45 a bale. That's for a four by five, sometimes a five by five round bale. Again, depends on what kind of hay, the quality, first cutting, second cutting, there's a lot. You could do a whole video on hay. Just know that it's a, it's a big expense. Our cattle's average around $325 a year. That's based on the prices I just gave you. Again, if you have a drought or you have a bad year for hay, hay could be a lot more expensive, so that number could go up very easily. But around 325, 350, We've been doing this for about six years now with cattle. That's about the average that we pay per head per year, about 325 to about $350. Some other ways of saving money. One is making your own hay, but yeah, whether that's saving you money or not, I'm sure you guys that make hay are probably shaking your head. There's equipment and that equipment breaks down a lot. There is the time to do it. it can be very time consuming to have to cut, then have to go back and tet, then have to go back and rake, then have to go back and bale. Then you have to move all those bales. It can be very time consuming. And that's provided everything goes right and nothing breaks. Obviously if equipment breaks, if it rains, that can throw everything off. And then there's the cost of the equipment itself. Sure, you can get cheap equipment, but if you're just getting into this, I wouldn't recommend that just because it's gonna need repairs, it's gonna need stuff, and if you don't know how to do that stuff, you're gonna just pay more money. So you might as well just buy some equipment that's actually gonna work for you. And the equipment isn't cheap. You need a tractor, you need a baler, you need a rake, spears and stuff for your tractor to move that hay. You may need a tether. There's, there's just so many things that go along with it. We lucked out and I got all of my hay equipment, minus the tractor, the hay equipment itself for about $10,000. That was the baler, the rake, and the tether. And then I bought the tractor brand new many years when we first started farming. So I had that. And again, it's about $10,000. So in that context, for us, it was worth doing because we got a good deal on the equipment. The amount of hay I can produce with that, I'm lucky that I have neighbors that have about 15 to 20 acres that I get to get hay off of their land. They just want it cut two, sometimes three times a year, I'll get hay off of it. And in addition to the land that I have, we end up with around 200 bales a year. So it's a lot. We even have some excess sometimes, so that's great. And that works for us. Again, it's gonna depend on your context, but just know that hay in general is the most expensive cost of raising cattle. So if you're thinking of getting into cattle, thinking of buying a couple head of cattle, that's something you have to figure in. And again, this depends on where you live, what your climate is. Look into your area, talk to some farmers, and try to figure out for you, your area, your context, what is hay gonna cost you per year as that's gonna be an ongoing expense that you're gonna have if you're raising cattle.